welcome to today's class. So, in the previous lectures we have seen how protein structure can be determined. Now, here onwards we are going to look at some of the application of those structure that we determined, how we can understand uh, the protein communi communication between protein, the interaction, the drug interaction, drug design and all those. So, here onwards I will be taking you through all these important concepts of protein ligand protein protein interactions and also followed by how we can use these to design a drug molecule. Okay. So, protein essentially are highly diverse molecule and they offer a communication pattern actually they communicate with various molecules. It can be a small molecule, it can be big molecule, uh, it can be even electron, protons, phonons all sorts of light it can interact with or some of the like a physically um, understandable molecules like a small molecules like a drugs protein interacts with a drug uh, many of the drugs you commonly use like aspirin, ibuprofen some or other protein interacts with these molecules. It can even interact with, with lipid all sorts of membrane protein are in lipidic environment and interacts with a lipid and regulates many of the important functions. Inter it interacts with a DNA and uh, like one of the DNA packaging machinery you know nucleosome is a nucleic acid protein interactions or it can interact with other molecules. So, their interaction actually repertries the, the stretch from atom over small molecules such as it, it can interact with a sugar, lipids or macromolecule. So, this dynamic personality of proteins through which it interacts actually offers a very elegant tool to understand many of the biological functions where protein is involved. So, what all essentially it, it does? So, actually protein protein interactions is a master regulator in cellular communication. All the cellular communication happens through protein signaling or protein protein interactions. So, they act as a glue to drive important phenomena in biology. For an example, in receptor activation, activation there is some protein protein interaction, signal transduction like a DNA replication, some protein comes and interacts with a nucleic acid to start the DNA replication. Even invasion, right, it is a viral invasion, bacterial invasion, some pathogenesis is driven by protein protein interaction. Therefore, it becomes paramount of importance if we want to understand the this like uh, how cellular communication happens, we need to understand the, the dynamics, thermodynamics, structural aspects of protein protein and protein ligand interaction and that is what we are going to do mostly this week. Right. So, protein protein interactions come can come in various shape and size the two proteins uh, can find a shape complementarity where they can interact or even they can like a, the disorder protein can bind to, to a protein and takes order. So, binding effect binding can have a direct effect like when two protein interact they can directly interact uh, and they can bind with each other and, and do its, its function like a signal transduction. Or uh, or it can have a allosteric effect. So, direct effect how they do basically upon binding some type of conformational change happens and that conformational change lead to signal transduction. So, that is a direct effect. It can have a allosteric effect. Allosteric effect in a simple term it binds to a site allosteric site and the effect of this binding is seen somewhere else. So, that is a like here the region which is regulated by allosteric binding happening somewhere else, the effect is transduced somewhere else. So, that is the allosteric effect. So, protein can protein protein interaction or protein ligand interaction in general can have a direct effect, binds somewhere, changes the conformation and this conformational change actually initiates the cascading effect and that is how uh, the signal gets transferred or it can have allosteric effect and that that is how uh, the signal goes from one place to other place right. So, so if this is so important 
protein protein interaction protein ligand interaction if it is so important because it, it tells about the cellular communication cellular, cellular regulation can we understand this quantitatively. Quantitatively I means like if two proteins or one protein one ligand is interacting what is the stoichiometry in which ratio they are interacting. So, what is the stoichiometry how, how they are like what is the kinetics of their interactions what is the forces involved energetics or thermodynamics involved in the uh, in their interactions. So, these are the some of the critical parameter that we need to understand the stoichiometry that means I, I mean to say ratio of their interaction, the kinetics, the rate with which they are interacting, um, k on rate, the rate with which they bind, k off rate, the rate with which they goes. So, k on k off rate can be understand. What is the thermodynamic parameter like? What is the enthalpy involved in this? What is the free energy? What is the entropy? Can we understand all those thermodynamic parameter quantitatively? Stoichiometric, kinetics and thermodynamics. So, for doing that there are various biophysical methods all sorts of like a biophysical methods are there which actually uh, which, which offers some of these uh, where we can understand the protein protein interaction protein rejection quantitatively. We can understand the magnitude in affinity um, like with the strength with which they are interacting they can even monitor the kinetics of interaction the rate with which they are interacting or like a what is the, the lifetime of the complex form like how long they stay in this complex form that also they offers, uh, offers to understand. However, we look at some of these methods biophysical method they are used but however, NMR spectroscopy is a method of choice that basically address the protein ligand interaction in a very elegant way that also we are going to look at. So, let us start with some of the some of the basic concepts of protein ligand interaction. Suppose a protein has one binding site where ligand is binding. So, we can write a simple reaction like protein binding to ligand and forming a complex and this PL is in equilibrium with the free protein free ligand right. So, assumption is protein has only one binding site. Right. So, we can write this equation. So, the ratio between the concentration of the molecule in the free form free state of protein and free of a state of ligand and the concentration of the complex PL if we get this concentration we can get uh, the equilibrium constant right. So, we can write it k equilibrium how much protein is in the free form how much protein uh, is in the complex form and that is how we can get the the k equilibrium right on this reaction. So, basic chemistry. So, they, then we can get a rate the rate with which they are associating k association and uh, rate is mole uh, inverse. Then we can have a also k dissociation the rate which the, they are essentially dissociating. So, like they are going back to the protein ligand form. So, we, we can know the rate of k on or k off k on means k association k uh, dissociation and we can determine the dissociation constant of a protein which can be uh, seen like this. So, k d is a simple simply uh, the free ligand concentration at which 50 percent of protein population is bound to the ligand. So, that is a k d. So, so, like you have heard about various KD, we will be explaining those KD uh, little more in detail, but actually it is just it is a term that determines uh, the ligand concentration at which 50 per percent protein is bound in the ligand form. So, looking at this simple reaction we can we can understand something about rate of association, rate of dissociation and this dissociation constant. Now, these strength of the binding can vary depending upon what sorts of interaction is happening and they can vary uh, like order of magnitudes. It can be nanomolar to millimolar. Nanomolar KD means very strong binding, ultra strong binding is nanomolar. We can have a ultra weak binding which is which is like a uh, more than 
mo uh, millimolar and we can have an intermediate which comes somewhere in the micromolar range. So, we can have all sorts of KD. Most of the biological phenomena occurs where the KD is in micromolar range and like they are transiently binding uh, with a micromolar strength and they goes off. So, these essentially forms lots of cellular communication. Uh, so, basically NMR spectroscopy is capable of providing quantitative information of protein ligand interactions affinity which is even lower than the micromolar range. Actually essentially NMR can report about the KD ranging from nanomolar to millimolar range. But before we go to, to, to um, the details of that, let us go a little bit more detail that what actually uh, the complex formation landscape for protein-protein interaction is needed. So, to start with we can determine the protein structure using various NOE based experiment or RDC based experiment. We can even get the parameters like uh, of, of the diffusion of the molecules like uh, uh, hydrodynamic radii and the KD and these are sensitive on 1D and 2D. So, let us look at complex landscape of protein interactions. So, when two molecules are in solution, they diffuse all the time like they are tumbling, they are diffusing, they are doing translational diffusion, even rotational diffusion. They come and, and encounter with each other. So, say protein, a, a big protein molecule we have here and a small ligands, they are diffusing and then they are coming and colliding, right. So, they occasionally encounter uh, each other and depending upon how precise the orientation is. So, here is suppose binding site and here is ligand. So, through search, uh, searching the appropriate binding site, sometimes it happens that they find the, the precise orientation and then two molecules form something called encounter complex, right. So, here is here is uh, say binding site and here is my ligand. So, it searches all the possible site and finally, when it finds the right site, it comes and binds. That is that is uh, we can call it that is a correct binding happening. So, when they form a precise orientation that will be called encounter complex and encounter complex is needed for, uh, for the proper interactions. So, the energy landscape we can say the two proteins here uh, quite disordered protein and here little order protein they are in unbound form they have one energy landscape which is like a 0 and when they form an encounter complex when they are coming closer but not so in precise orientation they form an encounter complex you see the energy is dropping down. So, that means they are becoming more stable and then they finally adjust to bind to the appropriate um, binding site that will be called aligned encounter complex. So, you can see energy further drops down and now that forms the stable protein ligand or protein protein complexes. So, first thing we learn they have to come closer by diffusion, then they have to find a proper orientation and finally, when they fit each other that is called aligned encounter complex the energy is down in the bound form, this is the stable state that we have formed. Now, when, when this encounter complex forms, it can have various way of searching it is it's a, it's a right conformation. So, two or three already we have learned right in the previous uh, cases, it is called induced fit or conformational selection, these are the two known concepts in the in the uh, protein ligand or protein protein interaction case. So, what happens that conformation selection says that there are various multiple conformation at the protein energy landscape available, ligand starts searching uh, the right kind of conformation and so it searches between all equally probable uh, ener like a, uh, energy states and one of the energy state which fits better it binds and lowers down the energy that is called conformational selection. In induced fit what happens that the conformation of either ligand or protein changes and basically it, it finds the right way to energy stabilize. So, it can change its conformation from here to here 
and that's how energy state is stabilized. Now there are various now recently some of the more states has been has been discussed which is called conformational restriction. So like in the previous slide we saw that the two proteins uh, in which there was one protein which was quite disorder and now it binds and takes some more order this kind of, of the um, conformational selection we can say conformational restriction is happening or it can even happen to accommodate a protein uh, or a ligand the other receptor proteins extended its conformation that we will call is a uh, conformational extension. So you can see here the, the um, like here is suppose ligand and blue one is a protein. Now conformation is getting restricted here you can see conformation of the red is getting extended. So this is a conformational extension, conformation means like a more equal probable energy states are coming and that is a conformational uh, extension or it can have a mix of con some conformational restriction, some conformational extension or it can even shift the conformation that is called induced fit. So one of these two methods basically protein interacts with each other. So if you look at carefully what is happening here two things are happening shift in the energetics of protein protein or protein ligand interaction. So that means the thermodynamics is involved here. Second thing what is happening here is a structural change happening because protein is changing its conformation either restricting or, or extending or like a induced fit also again conformation shift is happening. So structure plus thermodynamics both thing are changing. So if we want to understand protein, protein, protein ligand interaction, essentially we need to get hold of all those changes that is happening. Now most of the biophysical or structural techniques that are there to, to understand protein ligand interaction, we can classify them that they fall in two groups. Either they measure the thermodynamic or kinetics of interactions. So they measure the thermodynamics or kinetics of interaction. Some of them we can classify as isothermal titration calorimetry, uh, which measures the essentially thermodynamics. The surface plasma resonance again that measures the the K on and K off rate. So measures thermodynamics. Dynamic light scattering essentially it measures the how shape and size of the molecule changes. Briefly, I'm going to discuss all these. And then there are techniques which elucidate structure that that may happen upon interactions. So um, those again we are briefly going to study uh, the thermodynamic and the structural techniques but and then we will come why NMR can be used to study protein protein interaction. So essentially let us focus on the thermodynamic parameters that are there. One of the prominent one is isothermal titration calorimetry. What happens here? It is isothermal means same therm temperature, titration we are titrating it and calorimetry because it measures the heat. So same like as we are maintaining the same T like therm, isotherm, we are titrating two things and measuring the heat that is why it is called isothermal titration calorimetry. So what essentially we are doing? We have two cell, one is called sample cell, another is called a reference cell. They are maintained at, at the um, they are maintained at isotherm um, with uh, some thermocouple and they are in adiabatic jack jacket so that no heat transfer happens with surrounding. Now here is a reference cell that has a feedback loop maintains the temperature and here is my sample and uh, here is my ligand sample ligand we are titrating so we are injecting each time here so you can see injector and here sample cell. Now this is my protein shown in red and blue and orange and yellow is my ligand. So we are each time we are adding some ligand okay. Upon addition of ligand heat change happens they, then again it brought back because we have a reference cell and sample cell. So brought back to the isotherm again we add and then heat change happens. So because of this heat change happening we are measuring here dq by dt change in the heat <coughs> with time. So that is what uh, we are measuring change in the heat with time micro cal per second 
each addition of ligand there is a heat change. Now what happens that after this after some times it gets saturated and you see there is no further heat change. Now what we will do we will fit this equation which is here and from fitting up this equation essentially we get various thermodynamic parameter delta H the change in enthalpy, change in entropy delta G and change in stoichiometry or N. So, how many molecules binds to one protein molecule that is delta N, what is the free energy change, what is change in entropy and what is change in enthalpy. So, this isothermal titration calorimetry is a wonderful technique to understand the thermodynamics of, of the protein ligand protein protein interaction. The other one which is which is used commonly is called surface plasma resonance it also measures the thermodynamics. So, it is it is like a here you immobilized your receptor on the sensor chip okay. and here is a prism you have a light source optical detection unit and whatever like it upon binding it forms plasmon then refractive index is changed and that essentially gives you the rate of association. So, that uh, refractive index change is measured in terms of response unit and like here you can see the angle changes uh, upon binding when you flow some ligand. So, upon binding the flow channel has so upon binding so here is a receptor here is my ligand coming and binding upon binding some uh, response unit change that you plot it. So, what happens when it uh, starts binding it shows a curve which is called association curve. So, K on association curve and then finally you uh, you wash with buffer then it dissociates and then you regenerate your chip so that the next set of experiment can be done. So, here is an light injection you do it associates then it saturates you can see here saturation happening and then you dissociate it. So, with time we can measure the K on rate, K off rate and that again gives you the KD. Precisely surface plasma resonance give you the on rate, what is the rate with which ligand bind to a protein, what is the rate with it its get dissociate and then finally you can calculate the KD. So, very important it measures the K on rate and K off rate. The third one that we talked is, is essentially dynamic light scattering that also gives some idea of protein ligand protein protein interactions. So, essentially this measures the how the molecule fluctuate in the solution. So, if you have a small particle that is fluctuating you can plot a correlation function and if it is a, a small particle tumbles very fast. So, you can have a here correlation function that shows the, the decay is happening fast and large molecule slowly tumbling you can see the, the intensity of this large molecule um, is like a uh, quite broader. So, here you can see when it form a complex you have a different kind of correlation function and you can plot it to get how the shape upon interactions has changed, how, how the size molecule has become bigger. So, these are the three techniques essentially this does not give the thermodynamics but gives idea about the change that happening and this is again a low resolution technique. So, now coming back to upon interaction some of the high resolution techniques that gives you the complex structure, the static three dimensional picture of protein protein or protein ligand complexes. One of them leading um, technique that is used is essentially X-ray crystallography. So, what happens that you take a, a protein and ligand or two proteins, you crystallize them, diffract it and using the electron density map you can get the three dimensional structure of protein protein interaction. The another one not so precise, but now it is quite uh, used because of its sensitivity is called EPR. Again uh, you have a, you have to have a paramagnetic tag add and then one can get the protein complex interactions how the paramagnetic tag interacts with the other partner one can get the, the structure of a protein. The third one is small angle x-ray scattering right. So, here essentially when the uh, it is kind of a x-ray scattering, but does not give high resolution atomic resolution structure gives a overall shape and size of a molecule. So, here you have to like um, uh, again the complex which forms bigger will give a different kind of a scattering pattern. So, you know that now complex form has a the recent phenomena of cryo-EM 
uh, that is excellent tool for understanding the Bicker complexes and coming more and more um, profoundly which understand the uh, three dimensional structure of a protein ligand or protein complexes. Another very important technique called analytical ultra centrifugation essentially that also change how like uh, that also reports upon complex formation how the molecules sediment. So, the you can measure the sedimentation coefficient and that also says that uh, the complex formation happens. So, essentially the sedimentation coefficient is lower when it is in, in the free state and when it is in bound state it becomes higher. So, essentially you get a, a, the shape and size of a molecule uh, that can be complementary to dynamic light scattering. So, AUC, cryo EM, SACS, EPR and X-ray crystallography gives you the static three dimensional structure picture. Another important techniques where you can even get the dynamic mode of association is called Froster resonance energy transfer a fluorescence based technique where you have a two fluorophore attached on two molecules can be ligand and protein and how they come closer and uh, get associated you can measure the distance between these two fluorophore using this fluorescence technique called FRET and then measure the dynamic mode of association even the mode of complex formation. So, these all techniques thermodynamic and, and the structural mode of interactions can be used. Now, the question remains then what NMR can offer you? Can NMR offer simultaneously both of these, these techniques, uh, these, these aspects structural as well as the thermodynamic and kinetic mode of. So, we know that, that um, um, one can understand the structure of protein already we have seen that can be determined using NOE based restraints, the dipolar interaction, the distance restraint helps us to get the structure of a molecule and we can determine the structures. Once this structure is there, the static or complex structure, we can get the structural details. For there probably you need a labeled protein and you can have an unlabeled uh, ligand. So, using these we can determine the structure. What you need? A spectrometer and most of the time protein labeling is needed. We can determine the structural details at atomic resolution and also we can measure the kinetic, uh, kinetics of binding, thermodynamics of binding. So, here onwards we are going to delve deeper into how we can measure the thermodynamics and kinetics sim simultaneously along with the structure of a protein ligand or protein protein interactions. Okay. So, what you need for doing NMR? essentially the protein concentration which should be more or like a 500 micromolar or more. You need a ligand which will be like a typical depending upon binding constant. You need to have a more than 0 micromolar, some micromolar concentration you need. The stability for this interaction protein should be stable for 24 hours or so and, and temperature is also important. Many proteins are stable in this range. So, temperature is also important what temperature we choose, but one thing one caution is there the exchange rate uh, depends upon the temperature. So, if you go at higher temperature the on off rate can be different. So, you need to choose an appropriate temp temperature we want to understand the complex formation. The pH is, is very important, uh, pH should be less than 7 and it should offer the good protein stability preferably less than 7 because amide proton does not exchange and you can detect all the amide protons. So, pH you have to choose for doing NMR experiment which should be less than 7. Oh, which buffer? A buffer which does not interfere with the protein signal. Many of the buffer like a mesh buffer and all those has lots of proton in itself that overcrowds the protein spectrum. So, we should avoid those kind of buffer. Phosphate buffer is the best buffer to choose, but actually it depends upon where your protein is happy and stable. So, buffer has to be selectively chosen and the typical volume for doing this experiment should be 500 micromolar. So, if we have all these we are ready to go for protein ligand interaction and that is where we are going to start in the next class how we are going to now use NMR spectroscopy to study the protein ligand interaction and getting the thermodynamic kinetic parameter from it. Structural part we have already seen, but wherever needed I will come back and explain that. Thank you very much and looking forward.
to see you in the next class. Thank you.